We're discussing Mosiah chapters 1, 2, and 3. Not a very long block, but some really great things in here. So feel free to follow along. Uh, we'll be reviewing just some historical context and content of the Book of Mormon. And in there, we'll add a few things that you can study uh, and share with your family, some insights and things. So open up to Mosiah chapter 1. In here, we start with King Benjamin. Uh, let's review a little bit about his life. Remember, he grew up in the land of Nephi, but it was his father, uh, Mosiah, the first Mosiah, that moved the Nephite nation out of the land of Nephi up to the land of Zarahemla to escape the Lamanite persecution that they had been facing. And he, throughout most of his life, he had experienced warfare and fighting and so forth. And it wasn't until the end of his life that he says that there was a peaceful time in the land uh, when he was an older, older gentleman there, which we have his great King Benjamin's discourse that we'll learn a little bit about today. So in there, if we go to verse 2, we see that he has three sons. And this time, uh, King Benjamin is now older, and he wants to uh, teach his sons and he's going to anoint, and I'm using that term very deliberately, he wants to anoint a king. Now, we know about uh, spiritual anointings. We anoint kings. In this case, it's a literal anointing of a, of a king. But I think there's a prototype in there as you study this uh, that's kind of uh, insightful to look at. Uh, in his, He's teaching his son's language. It's interesting. Of course, every parent teaches their kid the language. They're just brought up with it. But in this case, it makes it sound like the language or languages that King Benjamin's going to teach his sons is not the language they're brought up with. Specifically, he says, I'm going to teach you a language. Well, what is he going to teach them? Well, if you go to verse 2 and verse 3, he specifically talks about the plates of brass which, if you recall, uh, he has in his possession now. And that language we know is somewhat uh, similar to the language of the Egyptians, which you have to remember now, by the time King Benjamin's around and turning the kingdom over to his son, we're about the same time difference between Lehi and King Benjamin as me and uh, Christopher Columbus, they probably didn't speak the same language. The culture is obviously much different. We always think Lehi and King Benjamin are just like grandsons. We're talking almost 500 years uh, separate the two. So it's quite a distance in there. So he's teaching, he's going to teach them the language. And then he goes off in verse 4 of the power of why he's teaching them this. Uh, notice in verse 4 it says... If it were, for it were not possible that our father Lehi could have remembered all these things to have taught them to his children. There's no way we can remember. I love oral histories, but the oral history does not remember everything. Have you ever played that game where you whisper something in your neighbor's ear and then they whisper it to someone's ear and it goes around a circle and by the time it comes back, it's nothing like it started? Uh, welcome to oral histories. They're great and they have some benefits, but there is a power in writing things down. And specifically, verse 4, it says the language of the Egyptians were on these plates. So he's teaching them those things. So if we go down to verse 9, this is ch uh, chapter 1, verse 9, uh, before and 7, he tells them to uh, study them diligently, but he's going to confer the kingdom upon one of his sons. And in verse 10, he's going to make a proclamation. Now, in, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, how many official proclamations have there, have there been? Uh, recently, we just received our sixth. Well, here is a proclamation that King Benjamin says, I want you to go gather everybody, and I want everyone to know what's going on. Why would he want everyone to hear this proclamation and see and witness the anointing of the new king? Think about that for a moment. Hope you get some ideas. At the end of verse 10, he specifically says, I shall proclaim unto this my people out of my own mouth that thou art a king. So he not only wants to anoint his son, Mosiah. Remember, he named his son after his father. 
He want, not only wants to anoint his son Mosiah, but he wants everyone to hear it. There, there's a power in that. There's no coup. There's no conspiracy. It is everybody heard, and they have a witness, and they have a, a testimony that Mosiah is now the king, uh, following his father and grandfather. But verse 11 is really what I think the proclamation's about. He says, Moreover, I shall give this people a name, that thereby they may be distinguished above all the people which the Lord God hath brought out of the land of Jerusalem. Now, how many people have been brought out? We don't know. There's lots of ten tribes. We know that the Jews were scattered. We know about the Mulekites, but specifically, King Benjamin wants to give this group of people a special name. And in verse 12, he tells them, And I give unto them a name that shall that never shall be blotted out, except it be through transgression. And we'll learn more about that at the end. So let's go on to verse 16. It's interesting that in verse 16, 15 and 16, he's giving his son not only the kingdom, but the relics that a king should have, at least in this kingdom, right? Verse 16, the plates of brass, the sword of Laban, the ball or director, which we all know is the Leahona. All of these relics are now being passed down, and there's a witness of all the people that they know that he has them. And at the very end in verse 18, he specifically says, I want everyone to go up to the temple. Now, the fact that he mentions up probably refers to the fact that this temple has been built on a hilltop and the people would climb up to the temple to hear the words. So there's the proclamation that this all can be done. So let's go to chapter 2 now. Mosiah chapter 2 at the end of chapter 2, or excuse me, at the end of verse 1 in chapter 2. They might go up to the temple to hear the words which King Benjamin should speak unto them. Verse 3, what do they do to prepare for this great conference, this great anointing? They sacrifice. They perform sacrifices of the firstlings of their flocks. Again, they're living in the law of Moses, so that's what they do. I'm just curious, when you have a general conference, whether it's recent or in your next one, what do you do to prepare for general conference? Is there a sacrifice of time, talents, maybe a, a preparation of studying or whatever it might be? What would the Lord have you do to prepare for his conference? If we go to verse 5 and 6, I think this is insightful. Verse 5 says, And it came to pass that when the people came up to the temple, they pitched their tents round about, every man according to his family. Uh, we see here a patriarchal family where a man and his wife and his sons, their wives, and their children, they're gathering Again, here's uh, different cultures have different customs, but here it appears that when a woman marries, she leaves her family of, of birth or family of origin, and she joins her husband's family. And, and that has appeared apparently what's going on here, as you see how they gather and organize as a family. And verse 6, and they pitched their tents round about the temple, every man having his tent with the door thereof towards the temple that thereby they might remain in their tents and hear the words which King Benjamin should speak unto them. There's an interesting comparison in the Old Testament here. This is in Genesis chapter 13, verse 12. Remember, Abraham and Lot were having some, uh, some conflict amongst their herdsmen. Well, and they divided the land, and Abraham took the rough, rocky terrain, and Lot took the soft, fertile, lush valleys. But in Genesis 13, verse 12, Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now, here it would be, if I were teaching this in a Sunday school class or a family home evening, I would just start with those two verses. I say, here we have a group of people pitching their tents towards the temple to hear the prophets and face the Lord. And here we have somebody who's pitching his tent towards the world, Sodom and Gomorrah, so to speak. What can we do to review to see if we're really pitching our tents towards the Savior in his holy house? 
that would be my discussion. I would take that as most of a family home evening or a Sunday school or a priesthood release society class if this were my scripture block. And we would just discuss. In fact, you might get answers something about, well, I walk around my house and we decided to put a picture of the temple in every room. Or we decided to, whatever it might be, and have some great discussion of that. Maybe it's just as simple of, let's make sure we all have a temple recommend. Whether the temples are open or we don't have one close by, I'm striving to have that temple recommend. It's a goal. So there's lots of things you can do to have a wonderful discussion with that. Uh, let's continue on now in Mosiah chapter 2. Let's go down to verse 9. Verse 9, you'll notice that King Benjamin wants his words not only heard, but he wants them written. We'll just think about general conference today. How do we get the words from conference? Well, they're sent out in video format on the internet. We get them in the Enzyme or on our phones. You can print, pull up, watch, listen, or read any general conference talk. But it's really interesting at the end of verse 9, it says, Don't trifle with my words, which I shall speak, but that you should hearken unto me, and open your ears that you may hear, and your hearts that you may understand, and your minds that the mysteries of God may be unfolded to you. If you recall from April General Conference, President Nelson in the Sunday morning session used three words, hearken, hear, and heed. It's what every prophet says, hearken, hear, heed the words, and then the result's the same. The mysteries of God may be unfolded to you. That's the end of verse 9. Love that one. So let's go to verse 11 and 12. Uh, again, he's gathering uh, the people. And then for the next several verses, he has an interesting and wonderful discourse about what's the role and the responsibility of a king. It's to serve. And he goes on for several verses here saying, I have, as your king, have labored with my hands. And now I he must be looking at his son Mosiah and, and saying, I expect you to do the same thing. And he's telling Mosiah in front of everybody, my son will be your servant. That's what a king does. I don't believe that their contemporaries back down in the land of Nephi had the same discourse. Meaning, Zenith, apparently... Even if he told his son Noah to be a servant to the people, the complete opposite effect took place. Noah becomes a glutton and lives off the high taxation of his people, which we'll get to at a later at a later chapter. Let's go to chapter 3 now. Mosiah chapter 3. Uh, verse 1, he tells him about a prophecy. I, I'm going to tell you of things that are to come. That's the last few uh, words of uh, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 2. And the things which I shall tell you are made known unto me by an angel. Well, there's lots of ways to get information. An angel should be a pretty high, reliable source. So notice he tells him that the angel said, Awake! And I awoke and beheld, and he stood before me. And what's the message of every angel in every dispensation of every time? It's verse 3. Glad tidings of great joy. And what are you supposed to do in verse 4, the middle of it? Rejoice. And at the end, you'll be filled with joy. Well, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the message is the same. So the next several verses is all about the Savior, his life, and his atonement. Verses 5 through 11. That's a great Easter lesson. That is a great lesson to have when you want to study more intently, uh, deeply about the atonement. Uh, study those words given to King Benjamin by an angel. Love it. Let's go to verse 17, though. Once they've learned about the Savior, Jesus Christ, in detail, uh, things that have not been mentioned in the Book of Mormon, at least, up to this point. And we don't have record of those details prior to the birth of Jesus Christ in the Bible. They're fabulous. But in verse 17, he says, Moreover, I say unto you, that there shall be no other name. Again, we're talking about a name here. No other name given, nor any other way, nor means whereby salvation can come. Unto the children of men, only in and through the name of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. 
And then he goes and talks about those who refuse to do this. So how do you get a new name? I want you to think about that. Well, there are several ways you can get a new name. One, in our culture today, if you're a woman, when you get married, you take upon a new name. There's a beautiful uh, uh, imagery and a type of Christ with that, of of leaving your former life behind and joining a new family, a new life, a new name. Uh, really interesting in there. But that's not what he's talking about. There's also the point where you can move away and just start a new life. Kids who go away to college, they can be whoever they want to be. They can start a new life. That's taken, in one aspect, a new name. I worked with a wonderful colleague years ago who said his dad was the town drunk. He was ashamed of his name. Well, he changed his name. Not literally, but boy, everyone I knew in his community respected him and his last name because of the life that his, he lived. He changed what his name meant and what it inferred to. Well, how do you change it here? It's verse 19. This is chapter 3, verse 19. I love this verse. For the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint, a latter-day saint. How do you become a latter-day saint? It's through the waters of baptism. How do you get a new name? What is the new name? The name is Jesus Christ. We take upon ourselves his name by putting off. We leave our former life, take upon his name, put off the natural man, and become a saint. Through the atonement of Christ the Lord, and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things, which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child does submit to his father. How do you become receive a new name? You become a child. Child of who? Well, you're already a child of God. We're born that way. But in here, it's something different. Christ becomes our father figure. We become his child. But it's not a natural birth like it is to become of our heavenly father. It's a spiritual rebirth, which when we accept Jesus Christ and put off the natural man, Christ becomes our Father. Next week when we discuss Come Follow Me, we'll be in Mosiah 4, 5, and 6, those three chapters, and we'll see how you become part of somebody else's family. In fact, the term adoption is even used, which we'll look at next week. Have a great week.